Hello, this is Richard Walker from Lucidate. Welcome to this fourth video in this series, Introducing Neural Networks. In this video, we're going to discuss backpropagation, the algorithm used by neural networks to learn. In this context, learning simply means nudging the weights and biases of our network to achieve an optimal set of outputs. The phrase optimal set of outputs here is not a subjective term. We use a mathematical function, a cost function, to measure how accurate our neural network is. We want to obtain a set of weights and biases that minimize this cost function. Up until now, we've been using computer vision as our use case for neural networks. We've justified this choice as computer vision is a complex problem that's eluded researchers using conventional programming techniques. That is to say, computer scientists have been unable to solve computer vision challenges using logic and if-then-else statements. But with the advent of neural networks that can solve this challenge, we've seen an explosion of applications from biometrics, number plate recognition, medical imaging, and driverless cars. For this backpropagation video, we'll take a brief departure from computer vision and use options pricing as our use case. Options have long been priced using parametric algorithms, such as the Black-Scholes equation that you see on your screen. These parametric equations suffer from some fundamental flaws, which often results in an observed options price being very different from the price predicted by the parametric equation. These flaws are results of implicit assumptions within the equation that may not hold in the real world. These parametric equations include stationary interest rates as well as stationary volatility. None of these parametric equations take into account liquidity effects. As a consequence, there's been a great deal of interest in non-parametric models that seek to map time series of underlying prices into observed options valuations. These techniques make no explicit assumptions about liquidity or stationary volatility. There have been over 100 papers published on the application of neural networks to more effective options pricing. Rather than the parametric options pricing model formulations that are familiar to many of us, a neural network will derive an output in terms of its inputs. This results in equations of the form shown on the left of the screen. Here, the first equation shows the outputs in terms of the penultimate hidden layer, the middle form shows how any arbitrary hidden layer can be calculated from the prior hidden layer. And the final equation shows the derivation of the first hidden layer from the inputs. In this post, we'll see how we use calculus to determine the sensitivity of our cost function to every single weight and every single bias in the network. Then we'll use the sensitivities to calculate optimal tweaks and nudges that will, over the course of many, many epochs, get the network to perform the way we want it to. Think of this like a giant mathematical combination lock. We have a cost function that measures the square of the difference between known outputs and what our network calculates. To solve the combination lock puzzle, come up with a set of weights and biases, the numbers on our combination lock, that get the cost function as low as possible. Open the lock. Let's first think about what tweaking our weights and biases will do. We'll look at biases first. Our bias term will determine whether our neuron will fire or not. A high bias is excitatory. You can see here that a high bias will mean that the neuron fires for lower levels of activation. Likewise, a low bias is inhibitory we'll need a lot of input activation or very high weights, or both, for the neuron to fire. If we think about our weights, the same thing is true. Higher weights create more excitatory signals in neurons in the network. Lower weights will inhibit the activation of neurons. The other factor that will determine the activation of a neuron are that neuron's inputs. That's the activations of the neuron's 
in the previous layer. Naturally, we can't directly change the activation of neurons in earlier layers, but we can influence these activations by altering the prior layers neurons, weights and biases. Therefore, the three things that can alter any specific neurons activation are one, its bias, two, the neurons weights, and three, the activations of the neurons in the prior layer. If we need an excitatory response for a particular neuron, we can increase its own weights and biases. We can't directly influence the activation of the prior layer's neurons as these are derived, but we can increase the weights and biases of the neurons in the prior layer. Similarly, if we need an inhibitory response for a particular neuron, we can decrease its own weights and biases. And we can't directly decrease the activation of the prior layer's neurons, but we can decrease the weights and biases of the neurons in the prior layer. Changes to the weights and biases of neurons in previous layers is where the term backpropagation comes from. When we're training our network, we backpropagate our error from output layer backwards through each of the hidden layers until we reach our input layer. Each neuron's activation can be increased or decreased by altering its own weights and biases, but also all the weights and biases of neurons in earlier layers in the network. The other thing to keep in mind is that not all nudges and tweaks to weights and biases are created equal. Weights are multiplied by activations, so even a large change to a weight that is connected to a neuron with a low activation will have little overall effect. Similarly, a large change in upstream weights and biases for a neuron connected by a zero or very low weight will have very little impact. Before we dive into the formal calculus, let's illustrate the two concepts we've just discussed, that of backpropagation and not all changes being equal. This will give us an intuition about what the backpropagation algorithm is doing. I hope you find this intuition helpful rather than just looking at equations of derivatives, which can be a little dry on their own. Let's invoke our options pricing example and focus on the last three layers of our neural network, our output layer and the two final hidden layers. We will label these two hidden layers L and K. We've provided all our time series data and other parameters way upstream in our input layer. Let's say our correct option price for this example is $7.25. Our output is showing the incorrect answer of $6.53, still a very long way from the correct price. It's too low by 72 cents. There's clearly a lot of work to do to nudge the weights and biases before this would be a useful model capable of generalizing. We need to increase the activation in our output layer. What will help with this? The most proximate help is from the output neuron's own bias. Increasing this will increase the output activation. We could also increase the three weights connecting the activations from layer L to this output neuron. Finally, we can look at the activations in layer L itself. Increases here will increase our output activation. Clearly, we can't nudge these activations directly, but all these neurons have their own biases, BL1, BL2, and BL3 in this diagram. Increases to these biases will increase the activations in layer L, which in turn will increase our output layer. Similarly, each of the neurons in layer L have their own weights. These can be nudged up to increase the activations in layer L which in turn will increase the activation in the output neuron. We'll continue this process all the way back to our input layer. Increases to the biases in layer K will push up the activations, as will changes to the weights that connect these neurons to the previous hidden layer, which is hidden off to the screen on the left. Again, I hope you see where this back propagation term comes from. The error or loss cascades back through the network from the output layer through all the weights and biases of the previous hidden layer, and then through all the weights and biases of the preceding hidden layer to that. This cascades back all the way to the input layer. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that not all nudges are created equal. 
What do we mean by this? Well, look at this weight here. It's connected to a neuron with a high activation. Even small changes to this weight will have a big impact on the activation of the output neuron. At the same time, look at this weight. This is connected to a neuron with a very low activation. Because of this, even large changes in this weight will not have such an effect on the output. Next, look at this weight. It has a very high strength. That means that even small changes to the activation of this neuron in layer L will have a large impact on the output activation. Of course, as we've said repeatedly, we can't change the value of this neuron directly, but it does mean that even small changes to the bias or to the weights connected to this neuron will have a large effect on our output. Now, bear in mind this is the result of one training example. We spoke in the last post about the importance of getting as many examples as you can. If we supply the market data and correct option price of a second example, we'd expect a different result with a different loss. In this case, our model has overpriced the option by $4.35. We'll need to lower this loss, so we'll need to decrease the weights and biases. Over the course of a whole epoch, we would expect to see a range of losses, some positive, some negative. Our mean squared error cost function will ensure that these losses are all cumulative for the cost for that epoch. So, there are two very important takeaways before we cover the screen in Greek letters and subscripts. Firstly, understand how the error or loss propagates through the network from output to input. Secondly, that the nudges to weights and biases are uneven. Even very small changes to activations that are connected through high weights will make a big difference. Likewise, a very large nudge to a weight that takes an input from a neuron with low activation will have a limited effect on the final output. If you're comfortable with these two concepts, then the calculus will be much more intuitive. Calculus allows us to determine rates of change, how much one variable changes with respect to another. It also allows us to do things such as find the minimum of a function. Here we see a function on our screen. We see the formula along with the function's graph. This graph plots the value of the function for a range of input values x. This function has a minimum when x is 6.22. Here's how we can use calculus to find the minimum of this function. The slope of the function is given by how much y changes for a given change in x. If we make the changes very small, we can get the tangent or slope of the curve at any point x. This slope could be positive when x increases, y also increases, or it can be negative. This is where an increase in x will lead to a decrease in y. The slope can also be zero. It will be zero at the minimum of a function. If the slope is positive, then we will need to decrease x to head in the direction of the minimum. If the slope is negative, then we will need to increase x to move towards the minimum. The slope can be steep, in which case we will want to alter x by a larger amount to get to the minimum. And the slope can also be shallow, which it will be when we're near the minimum. Here, we will make much smaller changes to x. This technique of using the direction and size of the slope to find a function's minimum is called gradient descent. One evident problem here is that it can get stuck in local minima. As you can see, there is another minimum on the chart where x equals 2. One way of avoiding getting stuck in local minima is to use a technique called stochastic gradient descent, or SGD. Here, rather than computing the exact gradient by using all of the training examples, we take a sample, a smaller sample, of the training set. This gives us an estimate of the true gradient, but one with enough noise and randomness to jolt it out of any local minima. So now we have a strategy, stochastic gradient descent, that will help us choose the optimum set of weights and biases for our network to get our cost function as low as we can. We'll walk through an example to see how this works. 
Let's start by writing our three equations for the neural network. Firstly, the output layer derived from the final hidden layer. Secondly, any hidden layer from the previous hidden layer. And finally, the equation for the first hidden layer derived from the input layer. Writing the equations in this way simplifies the expression and lets us deal with an arbitrary number of hidden layers. We can then write out our cost function as the mean of the squared error. The cost function itself is a function of our neural network. To make that explicit, let's plug our output layer equation into the cost function. We now have an expanded version of our cost function to look at the mean squared error between the training samples, the correct answers, and the output of our network. This version is written in terms of the activation function, the weights and biases, as well as the activations of the previous layer. We want to minimize this cost function. To do that, we need to nudge our weights and biases to get a cost function as low as possible. We'll use calculus and stochastic gradient descent to determine the sensitivity of the cost function to our weights and biases so that we can make the right adjustments to our network while it's being trained. Let's focus on just one training sample, which we'll denote with the subscript one. For this sample, we will have a known output, which we will call Y train. For many applications, we'll have multiple outputs, hence the representation here as a vector. For our option pricing solution, we have a single output. We can generalize this to a vector with a single value. This cost is a function of a function of a function. There are three nested functions. The first function is our composition equation. This multiplies the activations of the previous layer by the weights and adds a bias. The second function is our activation. This could be ReLU, hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, etc. Here we'll use ReLU. Our third function is the square of the error. That's to say, subtract the output of our network from the correct training result and square this loss. To have a strategy to nudge our weights and biases, we want to know three things. Firstly, the sensitivity of the cost function to the weights in the output layer. When we change the weights, how much does the cost function change for this training example? Secondly, the sensitivity of the cost function to the bias in the output layer. When we change the bias vector, how much does the cost function change? Finally, we would like to know the sensitivity of the cost function to the previous layer's activations. As we've said, we can't directly nudge these activations, but we can nudge this layer's weights and biases. If you recall, this is where the idea of backpropagation comes in. By knowing the ideal adjustments we'd like to see in the activations of the previous layer, we can determine how we would like that layer's weights and biases. Also, that layer's previous activations to change too. We can thus keep propagating the error or loss back all the way to the input layer. For nested functions, we use the chain rule from calculus. This states that for functions of functions of functions, we simply multiply the derivatives of each function. We have three variables here, weights and biases of the output layer and the activations of the previous layer. So we will take the partial derivative of each. Partial derivative sounds like a fancy term, but it simply looks at changes only to the variable in question. Everything else is regarded as a constant. So the partial derivative of the cost function for this example, with respect to the weights in the output layer, or how much does the cost function change for a small change in the weights can be determined by applying the chain rule to our equation. The first function is our composition function. The weights multiplied by the activations then added to the bias. If we differentiate this with respect to the weights, then the bias term disappears and we're left just with the activations. The derivative of our ReLU cost function is either zero or one. Finally, when we differentiate the third term, which is the square of the error, we get two multiplied by the error. We can simplify the equation to this. So the derivative is either zero or the loss multiplied by the previous layer's activations multiplied by two. Let's just pause and review where these terms come from. Firstly, we differentiate the composition function with respect to the weights. That gives us the activations from the previous layer. 
Then we differentiate our ReLU function, and that gives us one or zero. Finally, we differentiate our squared error function. That gives us twice the loss. Then we go through the same process for the other two partial derivatives. To get the sensitivity of the cost function for changes to the bias in the output layer, we differentiate our composition function with respect to the bias vector. The derivative of the bias is simply one. Furthermore, the derivative for the ReLU and the squared error terms are identical to our first equation when we looked at the weights. Finally, we want to determine our sensitivity to the previous layer's activations. Again, to restate, we can't directly alter these activations, but we can use the sensitivities to see what we would like to alter further up the network. The clever backpropagation trick is at play. The derivative of our composition function with respect to the previous layer's activations is simply the weights. And following through the rest of the chain rule, we get the now familiar terms for our ReLU and our squared error. Let's look at a matrix representation of this. In blue on the left, we have our weight matrix. In yellow on the right, we have our bias vector. And in purple, in the middle, we have the activations of the previous layer. We multiply the blue matrix by the purple vector, add the yellow bias terms and apply our activation function. What calculus and stochastic gradient descent give us are sets of nudges for our training examples to minimize the loss. That's to say, modify the weights and biases so that over time, the network's calculated answer gets closer and closer to the correct answer from our training data. That's a lot to take in all at once. Don't worry if this takes a while to sink in. Frankly, all you need to know is that there is a strategy for determining the weights and biases in a neural network. They're not pulled from the ether. Rather, they're derived using a formal, iterative approach. So, in summary, a neural network learns by updating its weights and biases in response to training data. It's incentive to learn is to solve a mathematical equation, a combination lock. It has to come up with a set of weights and biases that minimize a cost function. To solve this equation, it uses a technique from calculus called stochastic gradient descent. This method looks at the sensitivity of the cost function to every single weight and every single bias. From this sensitivity, an optimum set of nudges to every weight and bias can be derived. This is Richard Walker from Lucidate. Please join me in the next video where we will use what we have learned to date and we'll start to build neural networks to solve challenging problems.